Let me now give the floor to Mrs. Sophie McGuinness so that she can tell us about the UN High Commissioners for Refugees point of view. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, we're very delighted to be here today on behalf of UNHCR to provide some perspectives to you all on an issue that I think is, is touching everybody at the moment, uh, irrespective of whatever DG you might be working in at the Commission or whatever political grouping you may be involved in or indeed whatever you're studying in university. This seems to be uh, a topic which is on the top of everyone's list. Indeed, I was at a meeting yesterday where we were informed that the European Space Agency were having a session on migration issues uh, earlier in the week. Um, we all wondered what that might be about, but certainly everybody is uh, involved in, in this issue. And there are real and rational reasons for that from the European context. But before coming into the European context, I wanted to maybe set the picture a little bit broader, um, as has been described from the outset. This really is a global issue. The refugee crisis is, is a global phenomenon um, which needs to be seen in its proper context. Uh, so if we could move to the next slide. A key point to keep in mind, even if we do see in our media in Europe huge coverage of arrivals in the European Union and in the greater European neighborhood is that we now have uh, nearly 60 million people displaced around the world in the, in the global sense. It's, uh, it's an incredibly high level of displacement and the highest level of displacement since indeed the Refugee Convention was first established uh, in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, and an important perspective to keep in mind is that the vast majority of the world's refugees, uh, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons are not in Europe or industrialized countries, but elsewhere in the world. And you can see from the statistic on the slide there that our Global Trends Report, which was produced giving the picture of, of, of the, the global picture at the end of 2014, showed that 86% um, of the world's refugees were hosted in developing countries, in developing regions. In the past five years as well, we've seen that at least 15 conflicts have erupted or reignited. Um, you know, we have issues here in Europe, of course, but also in Cote d'Ivoire, Central African Republic, Libya, Mali, Northeastern Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, and this year in Burundi. So we have existing conflicts which are continuing uh, and not being resolved and these are being compounded by new conflicts which are, which are being added. And the one I suppose that most of us are more uh, aware of these days is of course the conflict in Syria for which at the moment there is no immediate solution in place. In terms of the countries where refugees go to, the, the main countries where people are seeking sanctuary remain Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, Ethiopia, and Jordan. The numbers of refugees in the industrialized world have remained low. Uh, they are rising. In 2014, the European Union registered 626,000 asylum applications. These were first applications that were registered within the European Union. Uh, and these figures have risen. But still, in terms of the global picture, it's a far smaller proportion of refugees and people in need of protection that are coming to the European Union. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. I don't know how well you can see this, uh, this slide, but the slide attempts to give a little bit of a picture of the route that the previous speaker was, was talking about, where we are seeing arrivals coming in um, to Greece and then moving up along the Western Balkan route. The figures when it comes to arrivals differ, and this is one of the challenges, I think, for the European Union, for member states and, and partners, is to try and predict what might be happening with flows. Um, the arrivals into Greece 
there are a number of issues that can influence the numbers of arrivals. There was a pattern in the summer period of around 8,000 persons per day, sometimes more. And only about six or seven days ago, the number dropped down dramatically to a couple of hundred. And on one day, there were only 74 arrivals into the Greek islands. And we wondered if we were spotting a trend, but then within a couple of days, the, the numbers of arrivals went up again into the hundreds and back into the thousands. And we are estimating that the numbers of arrivals will continue around 3 or 4,000 a day to 8,000 a day, weather depending. Also, the routes, uh, particularly the maritime routes, are, are quite uh, climate dependent. The route from North Africa to Italy is a much broader expanse of sea, and there's far less uh, traffic on that particular route in the winter months. But the route from uh, Turkey to Greece is a much smaller expanse of sea, and we expect to see those um, arrivals continue. In terms of the crisis that we do see, I think from our point of view, we see it more as a crisis of solidarity, a crisis of values, a crisis of how to respond, rather than principally a crisis of, of numbers from the global perspective that I've just outlined. And the European Union and other partners have been rallying to try and provide an appropriate response. And I want to run through a couple of the measures that the European Union and other actors are looking at. Um, some of these have already been mentioned by Michael, and I won't, um, I won't dwell on the ones which you covered in, in comprehensive detail, and thank you very much for that. These measures are really focused around, from a UNHCR point of view, about ensuring that people who are in need of protection get access to protection. When we look at the common European asylum system that was developed um, perhaps by many of you who are here in the room as well in your time in the European Parliament and others who worked in the institutions, a body of instruments has been elaborated, directives and regulations, which regulate what should happen when people come to the European Union seeking protection. There are elaborate rules in place. There is a Dublin regulation. There are regulations on how procedures should be rolled out. There are regulations and standards on reception conditions. And this body of this common European asylum system has been challenged by the uh, numbers of people arriving. And in many ways, it has not met the mark of that challenge. And a lot of people are looking for solutions to the issues. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the bodies of law that are already there and how we can tweak them in the fastest way possible in order to provide the legal framework that people of concern are entitled to, but also to provide the kind of legal framework that member states of the European Union are actually obliged to provide, given their commitments under the Charter of Fundamental Rights and other instruments to which the member states concerned have either been involved in drafting themselves or have signed up to. So if we look back to May 2015, which seems like an awfully long time ago now, the European Agenda for Migration was set out, which had a number of responses and a number of measures that were going to be brought forward. We had the increase of the operations, the maritime operations on search and rescue. Um, we've also had the hotspots, which uh, Michael has kindly covered. I mean, there on the hotspots, there is a lot of pressure at the moment uh, for those following this issue quite closely. The hotspot approach is central to the idea that this relocation mechanism will work. So on the relocation, the idea is that we will have 160,000 asylum seekers relocated from countries which are receiving many more asylum seekers than others to countries that are receiving far less. And it's important to keep in mind that the Dublin regulation as originally conceived provides for exactly this. It perhaps just wasn't utilized in that way. The Dublin regulation is the regulation that uh, regulates the member state responsible for processing an application for asylum. So in the normal course, when somebody arrives in a European Union country, the first authorities that they are in contact with are responsible for the processing of, of their case. However, there's a very important solidarity mechanism within the Dublin regulation which says that a member state can, can um, 
uh, choose not to send back to another member state uh, an asylum seeker who comes to their country. So, for example, when we saw large arrivals into Malta or into Italy, we had countries perhaps further far north in, in the European Union who receive very small numbers of asylum seekers. And it was open to those countries to choose not to send back to the countries in the south that had received a lot of asylum seekers to choose not to send them back in order to provide some measure of solidarity. That didn't really happen in the way perhaps that the drafters envisioned that it might in the context of great solidarity between European Union member states. And in effect, the solidarity mechanism was really used only when the situation in the state to which a person would be transferred had really gone into great, great difficulties and to return that person to that country could cause problems <laughs> under the European Convention on Human Rights or the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But the solidarity mechanism was there, just perhaps not utilised as far as it could have been. The Dublin regulation also underpins the relocation mechanism, but all of this is really reliant on member state goodwill. So far, we do not have sufficient pledges from member states. Hopefully more member states will, will, uh, will put in place immediate pledges or, or requests to take people in under the relocation mechanism. And also a lot needs to be done in Greece and Italy to get these hotspots um, up and running so that the relocation mechanism can work properly. There are other mechanisms that are, that are on, underway, including on funding. Um, and if I could just maybe, maybe briefly talk about two of the most recent uh, mechanisms that are most recent measures that have been um, agreed upon. On the 25th of October, there was a leader summit which involved all of the member states um, who are affected by the journey of persons through the Western Balkan route. And at that summit, there was an action plan that was agreed to. 17 points were set out in that action plan. And there was a lot of um, pressure for the leaders to come up with measures that would immediately respond to the kinds of scenes that people in the European Union were watching on their TV screens. Uh, scenes of thousands of people uh, on the borders of the European Union or within the European Union arriving to um, overburdened reception conditions or, or no uh, reception conditions in place. And at that meeting, a number of key issues were raised. And one of them was that the member states would agree to meet once a week uh, together with key partners, including uh, UNHCR and others, to make sure that they cooperate, that they talk to each other about what's happening on the Western Balkan route and further along so that countries can coordinate their response. Um, those meetings are taking place on a weekly basis. There is weekly contact. But there are a lot of challenges still remaining to encourage the member states to coordinate on their action. So we have seen in recent weeks uh, member states introducing measures, including in relation to access to borders or access to territory, um, screening on the basis of nationality, these kinds of things. And I think what's central here is that there is a coordinated approach so that we can avoid any further humanitarian distress to people who may be traveling along that route. As part of the uh, leader summit as well, in order to try and stabilize the situation, it was agreed that 100,000 additional reception places would be put in place um, along the route and in Greece. So it was agreed that in Greece there would be 50,000 additional resettlement, uh, reception places uh, created and along the route, a further 50,000 additional reception places. And what that's about is to try and change the scenario from the current situation, which is that many of the countries along the Western Balkan route are what could be described as transit countries. People are arriving into those countries, uh, like Slovenia, like Serbia, like Croatia, and they're remaining for six to nine hours and then moving on. Uh, in that situation, it's very difficult for the ultimately the receiving states, such as Austria and Germany and others, to put in place preparations and measures.
but it's also very difficult for agencies such as IOM, such as UNHCR, to deliver interventions if people are moving along very quickly. So, for example, we see unaccompanied minors um, on the route, separated children who, who may have protection needs. Uh, we see women and elderly people with, with health issues. Um, and because there are uh, not the reception possibilities or the conditions for them to be able to remain, they are moving on even though they have needs which are not being addressed. In terms of those reception spaces, we are working very closely with all of the member states and they have made these commitments to put in place those additional uh, reception places and we hope that the member states will rise to that challenge and put in place the additional reception places as swiftly as possible. For our part in Greece, uh, UNHCR is going to be delivering 20,000 reception places for people who opt to participate in the relocation scheme or for people who opt to participate in the Greek asylum system. And those places will be provided through uh, a voucher scheme. The idea behind that is that hotel accommodation or host accommodation can be accessed for people to, to stay in those places. And these are also, in a way, designed as measures to give back to the, the communities on the five islands in Greece and also elsewhere in Greece where people might be able to participate in these schemes. In terms of the particular calls from UNHCR, one of the major calls that we have as a way to respond to the protection needs of this crisis are the creation of additional legal pathways for people in need of protection to come to the European Union and to come to other countries in safety and in dignity. Uh, we have been calling for additional resettlement numbers. Uh, we have an annual resettlement program where we encourage resettlement member states to resettle people into their countries. And the uh, European institutions also, also have stood up on that and put in place a resettlement program. And there are 22,000 places pledged for that. That also brings me on to uh, the most recent meeting, which was the EU-Turkey summit. Um, there was a statement agreed at that summit where there are a number of measures that will be put in place by Turkey and support offered by the European Union to Turkey, which has been hosting over two million uh, refugees and asylum seekers, principally from Syria. And, um, spending a lot of money and resources on that. And there's an indication now that the European Union and member states will step up their support to Turkey in order to also provide the conditions for people, as the previous speaker was mentioning as well, perhaps to be able to remain and to build livelihoods uh, in Turkey where they are. Another issue that was flagged in the press conference after that summit was the idea of an admission scheme, a resettlement scheme, or a humanitarian scheme for the admission of people from Turkey to the European Union and possibly other countries um, in, a, in an organized format. And I think one of the things that is a, a driver through all of these measures is indeed uh, what Michael mentioned earlier, the, the hope to try and bring a little bit of control and order back into the system so that people in need of protection can be swiftly identified, uh, people who may not be in need of protection and who may have no other compelling humanitarian reasons to stay, that they would be properly assisted and directed uh, towards assisted voluntary return. And if assisted voluntary return is not something that they were willing to take up, then eventually they would need to be assisted to, to return back to, to their own countries through the, the removal procedures. So I think we're, we're trying to come up with, together, working together with member states uh, and the European Union institutions, um, a coherent and holistic approach which will address the needs of people who are in need of protection and also the needs of, of other groups who will be in need of, of advice and other supports. In addition to resettlement and humanitarian visas, and given that we have some students in the room, another scheme that we are trying to promote is student scholarships for, for example, Syrian students who may be uh, in third countries in the region who can't access university to come to the European Union or other countries to continue with their studies. There are some very interesting uh, projects that are already underway in many countries, 
uh, and we are seeking to enhance those partnerships. We have an interesting partnership with Spain, which is, which is just about to take off. There are discussions ongoing with Canada, with the Czech Republic. There's a small scheme that is being set up uh, in Ireland, where I was previous to coming to this, this new role. So there are many things that we, can, that we can try and look at. Of course, creating legal pathways is not going to be the solution to the problem, given the scale of it. But these are important additional measures to the broader set of measures that are on the table that I wanted to address also. So I think I'll leave it there, but I'm open to any questions people may have after also. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McGuinness.